things in life are so arresting as a spectacular car accident, and you're looking at the happy survivor of a three-way crash. The three vehicles I'm talking about that have collided are science, money, and the free flow of information, sometimes called the public's right to know. The collision keeps happening day after day, year after year. I've been involved in science publishing since 1991, and I can tell you that these three vehicles, science, money, and the public's right to know, have been crashing into each other constantly for the last 20 years now. They started colliding even before the internet revolutionized the news, publishing, music, and movie industries. As a matter of fact, the information technology revolution just poured fuel on the fire. But the flames of the scientific publishing debate were already 20 feet high when the internet arrived. So what's all the fuss about? It has taken the form of a fierce and sometimes angry controversy between advocates of subscription-based publishing and open access publishing in the science space. On the one side, the advocates of traditional subscription-based publishing argue that their enterprise costs money and therefore charging for it is perfectly reasonable, even proper and necessary in a free market environment. On the other side, Advocates of open access publishing argue that, especially with today's technology, you can have your cake and eat it too. You can be profitable while supporting the broadest possible dissemination of knowledge. They also point out that the free flow of information is especially critical in biomedicine, where the research bears on no less than life and death. To some, this may seem like an arcane discussion, mainly of interest to publishers, a sideshow to the main business of science, and a long way from the concerns of the average citizen. After all, most citizens are not scientists. I see it differently. I believe that the question of open access publishing and the free flow of information goes to the heart of science and indeed to the heart of all of our lives. I don't know anyone who believes the mission of science is the commoditizing of data. I believe that reasonable people define the mission of science as the advancement of knowledge. And when it comes to biomedical science, the ultimate mission is supporting better health for people everywhere. I've published science titles that are behind a paywall and science titles that are free and available to anyone and everyone. So let me put my cards on the table and tell you where I stand. I'm an MBA by training and a capitalist by conviction. I believe in free markets and competition. At the same time, I also believe that when the best research somehow gets converted into a privately controlled, limited access commodity, we are in danger of losing sight of our purpose. I find it troubling when medical schools are segregated by money. It concerns me when students at a perfectly good public university in Tennessee or Illinois or Arizona can't get access to the best and most current science because their school can't afford the same subscription licenses as the Ivy Leagues. I don't think we want to be segregated by money. Health and medicine are too important for a tiered approach to knowledge. Can you imagine a situation where only the top schools were allowed to use calculus, but mid-tier schools and below had to be relegated to using only algebra? It's increasingly clear that the technology and information revolutions are overturning the centuries-old business models everywhere you look. I would not bet on science publishing being the last to that table. I'm fortunate to be in a position to help show that new models of publishing are good for science, good for business, and good for the public. Today, in addition to being a science magazine publisher, I'm also the chairman of the board of eLife, a new open access science publishing project launched last year. We are happy to compete in the free market, and may the best model win. 
So how did we get into this $21 billion controversy? The first scientific journal was launched in France in the 17th century. In order to share their science, researchers depended on publishers to physically disseminate it. Ever since then, publication has been the coin of the realm in a scientific career. It's the primary means through which universities and other employers and benefactors of science judge worthiness for hiring, promotion, tenure, grants, and awards. Under this traditional structure, a scientist doesn't have any choice. If she wants to advance her career, she has to publish as much as possible in the most prestigious journals possible. It's been this way for 350 years. Now, let's talk about money. Science journals paid editorial staffs to evaluate and select papers, recruited the best available professionals to do the peer review, and paid for ink, uh, printing, paper, etc. All of this costs money. Most of the time, there isn't any advertising revenue or very little of it. So costs were supported in two ways. First, through subscriptions, and second, through page charges, where authors of accepted articles pay to have their research published. And that's fine. We understand how it evolved. Science publishing is expensive, and somebody had to pay for it. It was a functional model. And furthermore, it promoted and supported an explosion of science publishing for a very long time. But as a result, today, we have about 24,000 active peer-reviewed science journals around the world dedicated to every possible field, to discipline and subdiscipline. Subscription costs can get very pricey, sometimes over $20,000 a year for a single title. Most science journal subscriptions are sold in licensing packages to institutions. The richer the institution, the more subscriptions they can afford. But here's why it gets tricky, and this is where segregation by money comes in. Like everything else, economies of scale have driven a consolidation in the science publishing industry. Today, a handful of giant players dominate the field. In fact, the top three science journal publishing houses control over 7,000 journals each. And that's fine, too except for the fact that the top three publishers disseminate about half of all the high-quality research studies, and there are objective metrics for what's high-quality, impact factor, and so forth. And there's a second driver of proprietary science publishing, nonprofit scientific societies. Many of them use their journals as their key revenue source. They make money from subscriptions, and naturally, they don't want to give that up. So where does that leave us? In a completely different world than when all this got started. It was time to rethink our approach. The rethinking got started in 1999. The NIH director at the time, the Nobel laureate Harold Varmus, was visionary enough to see the value and the necessity in open access publishing. He also was commanding and, perhaps you might say, naive enough to insist that it happen. Harold made several arguments for open access, including the notion that taxpayers had a right to access the research that they themselves funded, because the great majority of research funding in this country comes from federal dollars. Meanwhile, in 2000, I was executive director of the American Society for Cell Biology. Our flagship journal had been selling subscriptions, but to support open access, we decided to take it under a new publishing model. The Society became the first to participate in the public repository PubMed Central. We said open access is good for our members, and it's good for science. Therefore, we reasoned with something of a leap of faith that the rest will sort itself out. It was a risky and controversial decision, but we were successful and we helped launch a new era in science journal publishing. Then, 
in 2001, two California scientists, Pat Brown and Mike Eisen, launched an online petition calling for scientists everywhere to pledge that they would stop submitting papers to, review for, or subscribe to journals that didn't make the full text of their papers available to all, free and unfettered, either immediately or after a reasonable delay of some months. This led to the creation of PLOS, the Public Library of Science. PLOS was a small but scrappy force for open access. Not big enough to change the game all by itself, but successful enough to open the door to big change later on. It demonstrated an important proof of principle. Journals can make money in the open access environment if they are efficient and innovative. Plus, also showed that open access publishing eliminates many artificial constraints on scientific publishing. No limit on the number of papers or images or their length because there are no postage or paper or, or, or mailing costs. Articles are still peer-reviewed, but any rejection is due to quality, not due to economics. And that's where we stand as we launch eLife. But it's different than PLOS and other progressive open access journals because it represents a new pathway to open access publishing. This is because it's financed by the research funders themselves, in this case, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Wellcome Trust out of the UK, and the Max Planck Society. I believe that eLife has the people and resources needed to attract the best scientists and the most important papers. Profit is not a dirty word, not even in medicine. I like free markets as well as the next guy. The smart people at traditional publishers will adapt and figure out a way to succeed in this new era. Science is about <laughs> accumulating knowledge with each researcher building on what came before to learn something better or to do something different. My vision for the future of health and medicine is a world where every student and every researcher can benefit from any study done anywhere in the world. I look forward to the day when, just as we value a level playing field in business, we value a level playing field in the quest for new knowledge. I look forward to the day when the only limits on the scientific imagination are those in our minds. I believe that that model is more in tune with our times. Above all, I'm confident that the free flow of information will mean the faster advance of science, and that's good for science, good for education, good for taxpayers, good for doctors, good for patients, and good for all of us. Thank you.